because I clearly don't care like about their well-being. Yeah, you should so always really teach your kids not to do that. Yeah. Sort of Are we all yeah, sad? Like he does. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone. It is now six o'clock, so I will take this opportunity to call tonight's Scarborough Public Schools Board of Education School Board Workshop into session. Today is Thursday, July 15th. And with that, I would like the attendance, please. Sure. Mrs. Giftis. Dr. Gill. Here. Ms. Casalonis. Here. Ms. Layton. Here. Mrs. Lindstrom. Here. Mrs. Scyther. Here. Mrs. Turner. Here. Ms. Giftis. And Ms. Bertulia. Here. Perfect. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Agenda item 4.0 is our workshop this evening. Agenda item 4.1 is our DEI committee update. Carmen Rowland, Director of Programs and Delivery from Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium will be presenting to us this evening. Is Carmen on the stream? I mean, maybe she's like our. Um, <clears throat> In person, person like people in a building. It's not my house. You're out in public. I get out. I walk around the corner of the office. April, I think she needs to be promoted into the meeting. Yes. Thank you, Leanne. Perfect. I appreciate everyone's patience while we work out the kinks again tonight. <laughs> and at this point, I will turn it over to our facilitator, Carmen. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank Good you. Evening. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't realize I had to register. I was kept clicking on the link <laughs> and I didn't realize I had to actually register um, before it let me join the Zoom. So I sent an email to, to Diane and folks to say that I was uh, trying to get on and the meeting said the meeting hadn't started. But either way, I'm here. My name is Carmen Rowland. I am uh, the Director of Programs for the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. And I am glad to be with you all tonight to talk about some work that we've been doing with Scarborough Public Schools um, since about, um, I guess, late, uh, early spring. Um, on the uh, Diversity, Equity, and, in and Inclusion Committee. Um, if you wanna move the slides forward. All right, so yes. So just to give you a little background about the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, we were uh, founded in 1992 as a um, uh, education nonprofit. We're located in Bethesda, Maryland, and we've been working um, with school districts and state education agencies uh, up and down the East Coast uh, to support students and staff and faculty and ensuring that all students have access to an equitable education and equitable opportunities. Uh, you can go to the next slide. 
We operate uh, two federally funded centers. The first is the Center for Education Equity. That is our regional equity assistance center, which is how we've been able to work with Maine. We work with states, like I said, up and down the East Coast and then over to uh, West Virginia and Kentucky and then the Vir Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. And our partners uh, in the Center for Education Equity are the American Institutes for Research and West End. Next slide. And our goals are to improve and sustain the systemic capacity of public education systems to address problems caused by segregation and inequities. Uh, also to increase equitable educational opportunities for all students, regardless of their race, gender, religion, and national origin. Uh, and um, we provide, as I said, technical assistance and training to states, school districts, schools, and community-based organizations with, within Region 1 um, at the request of school boards and other responsible governmental agencies or the school board um, um, designees, such as superintendents or their designee. And the second federally funded center that we operate is the Collaborative Action for Family Engagement Center. It is one of 11 um, statewide family engagement centers funded by the Department of Education to provide a capacity building um, and work with school districts and state education agencies on ensuring that uh, families um, are involved and engaged in their child's education and for um, providing resources for school districts to, to implement culturally responsive uh, practices so that all families um, feel like they are, have a seat at the table and are engaged. So before we jump into um, some of the work that we've been doing with Scarborough, I thought it was necessary to provide just a little bit of background about who we are and our, our approach to doing equity work. So this slide here just outlines our, our data-driven equity framework that talks about the different dimensions of change, such, such as cultural dimensions of change, structural dimensions of change, and material dimensions of change. And the five pies, pieces of pie, if you will, in the center are all the things that we believe affect um, outcomes for students. And uh, the first, I'll start in the gray box, equitable systemic policies, procedures, and practices, uh, positive inclusive school climates, students that um, having access to rigorous curriculum, again, that family engagement piece uh, and working with uh, communities on that, as well as uh, goal setting for students and families and working with families to set goals for students. And then um, creating effective partnerships to build positive youth development. Um, so that's our, our the frame of reference for how we approach the work that we do. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide there. So what does educational equity work um, look like? So the process is um, we typically start off with a needs assessment. So um, working with our clients, um, in this case, Scarborough Public Schools on determining what are those needs for um, around equity, what's working, what's not working, who is it working for, who is it not working for. So that needs assessment, um, we conduct that and, and I can go in, in the next slide, I'll talk to you more about what that entails. Uh, before we go there, back to back on slide, please. Thank you. Uh, from the needs assessment, we then um, gather data and then use that to work with districts to develop a strategic plan and talk about recommendations for how the work, moving equity work forward, where to start. And then um, many times that leads into professional development, trainings and monitoring and implementing um, those changes and ensuring that there is a continuous improvement process and ongoing um, monitoring of the uh, recommendations that will be put in place or strategies and action plans that will be put in place. So regarding the needs assessment um, is data review. So thinking about um, existing quantitative data, so such as student grades, 
uh, attendance, um, uh, uh, um, proficiency on assessments, things like that, uh, qualitative document reviews, such as written policies or other documents or procedures that happen to be written that paint a picture of what life may be like in Scarborough and what students have to, um, students and staff, what are those rules, written and unwritten, that um, they abide by. And then um, qualitative, other pieces of qualitative data are interviews, uh, focus groups, um, climate surveys, and then classroom observations or other observations of different meetings that may be um, happening. Again, all of this is to get a sense of what's working, what's not working, and um, what do we, what might we want to do about that? And then even taking that data review even further um, and, and doing the microscope, we look at just aggregated data um, by race, gender, socioeconomic status, and language. So again, um, and looking for uh, students, different effects of, of different, um, different outcomes for different students, such as students receiving, um, uh, students on, that have individual education plans, students receiving uh, special education services, uh, again, looking at grades, um, promotion, differences in promotion, who's graduating, um, the graduation rate, standardized test, again, like I said, discipline, data, looking for suspension, expulsion, detention, and uh, again, attendance. And looking at those, um, doing a deep dive into those outcomes and, and looking for um, if there's any disproportionality related to um, some of those uh, identity variables and demographic variables, such as race, gender, language, special education status, so on and so forth. Next slide. So um, in terms of the committee makeup for the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Committee for Scarborough, there were two board members on the committee, two administrators, five teachers, staff members, slash staff members, seven community members, and six students. And here's the charge for the DEI committee. It says Scarborough schools are committed to creating a welcoming and safe environment for all Scarborough students and staff. The Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee in collaboration with MAEC will promote the goal of diversity, equity and inclusion for all individuals in our school district, regardless of their identity. Uh, the charge of the committee is to review data collected from climate surveys, school equity audits and listening tours, to raise awareness to the committee of work happening in the district within the boundaries of the board's existing policies, make recommendations to the Board of Education for the development of an action plan that outlines next steps for our district and to monitor action plan progress for a period to be determined by the committee to ensure that action steps are in line with actual needs. And so we stayed close to, these, uh, to this charge and um, in reviewing the climate survey data, which we'll get into here shortly. And this is what guided our work for the, for the spring semester. So we held meetings from March through July and we engaged in learning opportunities around diversity, equity, and inclusion, team building activities. Uh, we we spent a lot of time discussing data-driven dialogue and engaged in that top dialogue to review as we reviewed the climate survey data. We identified possible recommendations for next steps and um, we voted for consensus of, of recommendations to present to the Board of Education. So I'm gonna just review the data inquiry process to give you a sense of how we went about doing our work this spring. So this data-driven dialogue process comes from uh, a toolkit that MAEC has released uh, several years ago now on um, data-driven, equity-based uh, data-driven um, inquiry. And the first step in that process is to, before you even look at data, is to predict um, what you might see in the data. What do we already know? And it's calling into question our prior knowledge or not question, but calling 
up for us, our prior knowledge about what we may already know, what stories have we heard, and then um, going visual with what we might know. So that's when we collect more data um, and actually go and, and get the data. So for instance, attendance data, or in this case, school climate survey data, collecting that, and then um, making some observations of the data. What's the data telling us? What do we see just at face value? And then um, once we ask those questions, and observe, make some observations and ask questions. And one of the questions may be that we wanna um, go and get more data. So we may realize that we don't, you know, looking at the school climate survey is not enough. We wanna do another survey or we wanna find out more information um, on some other topic. So we go and collect more data and then again, make observations about that data. Uh, and then we draw inferences uh, around why we made, why the data may look a certain way, what might be going on with the data, what might've been going on in the context of a climate survey, which is a snapshot, you know, um, a snapshot in time. And then from there, identify some root causes um, by doing the five whys, you know, why is this and then why is that and so on and so forth. Um, and that all helps us get to a place where we can begin to identify um, next steps, action steps, action items. So the committee recommendations. Um, we have, I believe it's seven recommendations and I'm gonna walk you through the recommendations um, and the rationale for, those rec for each recommendation and then the support from the cli climate survey, which um, led us to suggesting this as a committee, um, the recommendation. So uh, next slide. So recommendation number one is to create a full-time uh, FTE K through 12 diversity, equity and inclusion position within the district. And we believe, um, the committee believes that having a district level uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion position will help to champion efforts within the district, ensuring consistency of DEI efforts across all buildings and standardize and streamline investigations of harassment, discrimination, bullying, um, et cetera. And uh, some support from the climate survey for this is this quote as follows from a student. I wish the school took every kind of harassment from sexual to verbal more serious than it does. Not that they don't do anything, but the actions aren't 100% what they should be. When a student presents a claim, they shouldn't have to wait months for something to be done. And even then it's not always properly taken care of. The student always should always be a part of the process through every step and should never feel unheard. So that's the, the first recommendation around having um, that full-time position staff member, a dedicated person that can coordinate DEI efforts across the district and across school buildings. And before we move on to recommendation number two, something I want to say is that over, overall, the climate survey data and results were very positive. So um, really congratulations to Scarborough on, on that. Um, and it's just, you know, there are some things that were mentioned in the, um, in the surveys that we wanna make sure that we highlight and uplift for you all tonight as you think about these recommendations going forward. So the picture is not a negative picture, um, but just some, there are some things that we wanna make sure um, that we address tonight with you. Uh, recommendation number two. So 2A, gather additional data and conduct analyses thereof to identify next steps to advance DEI efforts within Scarborough Public Schools. So the first um, part of this is to conduct more analyses of the climate survey data as a committee that disaggregates that data to determine if any disparities or disproportionalities exist between um, or by building, grade, race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, language spoken at home, socioeconomic status, um, et cetera, by the DEI committee um, or a subcommittee thereof um, or any of the appointees of the DEI committee. And the rationale for that is that when this climate survey is only reviewed 
in the aggregate, the demographic group with the largest response rate can overshadow the voice of underrepresented and historically marginalized um, folks. And uh, just some support from the climate survey from a parent, I witnessed the impact of this socioeconomic status discrepancy across the district and how students treat each other and wonder about the impact on education. So by looking at the data um, in subgroups or disaggregating it by different groups, we begin to see a truer picture of student experiences um, and, and parent experiences as well as educator experiences because we did three different surveys. There was a staff survey, parent survey, and student survey. Next slide. So for 2B, again, still with gathering additional data, uh, is gather and review additional data sets and conduct this aggregated analysis thereof. So for, as I mentioned earlier, discipline data, um, academic data, doing a panorama survey um, to determine again if any disparities exist by the DEI committee, a subcommittee of the DEI committee or its appointees. And the rationale for that is um, that by reviewing these existing data sets, if disparate treatment is found, steps can be taken to address disparities and create equitable outcomes for all students by the way of developing policies or revising policies that are already in place, um, et cetera. And uh, support came from this. Here's a quote from a teacher. The lack of accountability for behaviors is disturbing. We are creating future behavior problems because of the lack, the lacks of discipline. Okay, um, we can go to the next, which is 2C. Um, this one again is around still gathering additional data. Establish and or expand building level teams of stakeholders in a variety of roles. For example, um, making sure there's a building administrator involved on this, on this building level team, guidance counselors, teachers, parents, students um, to complete and review findings from the MAC building level equity audit tool to determine areas of strength and concern for each building. And we, su we suggest this because tasking a team of stakeholders who have a variety of roles and perspectives in completing an equity audit can help identify focus areas for DEI improvement at that school building level and perhaps even the district level. And the climate survey support for this is a quote from a parent. Many of these questions were difficult to answer because there isn't a way for parents to actually know what happens from day to day, especially with regard to the specific efforts the schools make to ensure equity in the district. Uh, we can go to 2D. Uh, this one again with uh, gathering additional data Engage MAEC to conduct stakeholders uh, focus groups. So that would be with parents, students, administration, faculty, staff, alumni, community members, et cetera, with interpreters and interpretation services for speakers of other languages as needed. But the purpose of those focus groups would be to explore stakeholders' qualitative experiences with regard to DEI and school climate. And the rationale for that is that while climate surveys are intended to gather surface level responses from a large pool of respondents, focus groups are intended to gather deeper responses from a smaller pool of targeted respondents. And uh, we had a student um, quote here to, uh, from the climate survey. So I hope more gets done for people of minorities for them to feel safe and welcome. I believe we were moving on to recommendation three, yes. Uh, recommendation number three. So this one is, we're moving away from gathering additional data. Uh, provide learning opportunities for stakeholders. So DEI committee members, administrators, teachers, parents, students, and best practices in DEI and culturally responsive teaching and learning. The rationale for this is that we increase awareness and knowledge of DEI, increasing awareness and knowledge of DEI provides stakeholders with information to create safe, supportive, inclusive schools where all students can learn and thrive. And a quote from a teacher is, uh, once I believed that teachers should be colorblind, but now I believe I must be anti-racist. 
conversations need to be had to push through systematic racism. And those conversations would happen in trainings and learning opportunities. Recommendation number four, identify ways to increase stakeholders' understanding of Scarborough Public School policies and practices for filing bullying, harassment, discrimination complaints, and the district's appeal process. Clear communication is needed to ensure that all stakeholders have the information necessary to allow targets of bullying, harassment, and discrimination to report incidents, understand the investigation process, and file an appeal if they are not satisfied with the outcome of the investigation. And a student said, I feel as though if I were bullied and or sexually harassed, I would not know where to go or who to talk to. And for that reason, where those resources and people exist should be clearly communicated for students. Next. Recommendation number five is to reconvene the DEI committee in the fall to continue this work including a process to onboard new members to replace any existing members who cannot or do not want to continue serving. And the rationale for this is uh, reconvening of the DEI committee will allow for continued review of the additional data sets and it's needed to identify next steps to support DEI efforts in Scarborough Public Schools. A parent says, I do, I do think this DEI program is very important to be sure our community is examining these topics and continue to educate faculty, administrators, parents, and students about its importance. So those were our five recommendations um, for moving the work forward in, in Scarborough with the DEI committee. Um, I'm, I'm glad to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Carmen. Um, I will go ahead and call on people as they express interest to speak. Sarah, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Carmen, for that. I guess my, my only question, or my first question, I guess, is um, would you recommend, like what's the timeline for actually implementing these actions or these things that you think you know, we do right, in the fall, right away in the fall or some of them things that you think we should wait until should we decide to um, bring on a DEI expert or make a DEI position in the district? Is that, are these things that we should wait and do until that person comes on board? Um, that's a really great question. I think there are some things that the committee could get started with, um, you know, such as identifying what data sets. So I, I just named some in the recommendations, right? But identifying where those data sets might live, what other work they may wanna do, um, or analysis that they may want to have of certain existing data sets. And the, the committee could start with that work um, and not wait for a, a, that DEI person to start. But I think when it comes to any implementation of action steps or um, thinking about policies or trainings and things like that, that may be what you want to wait for a DEI um, staff member. I keep saying DEI staff member, but the, the one person, right, that we're thinking that will be coordinator of um, DEI efforts in the district, that might be where you wait for that person um, to come on board to help think through and plan through some of those next steps. Thank you. Uh, Nick and then Kristen. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> Carmen, thank you so much for, oh wait, let me do this. Carmen, thank you so much for, uh, for presenting and for helping us move um, through this first year of this really important work. Um, I have a kind of a two-part question. First, as I look at the makeup of the committee, I'm adding up 22 people on this committee in addition to the support we received from your organization. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, because everyone I think knows how much I love giant committees, um, how you feel about the size of this committee. Was it a workable group? Was it, was it a little on the large side? Would you recommend more people? And then my second question is, as far as turnover on the group, do you think there's an advantage to having um, a fresh set of eyes, a fresh group of community members every year to kind of expand the breadth of this work or, or term limits of some kind. I'm just wondering how you've seen that work in different applications of this. Yeah, very, very great, great question. So for your first question, I think the size was actually just right. Um, I don't think we want to get any larger than 20, 22. No. People. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you about large committees. I'm, I was sensing a bit of sarcasm there, um, but uh, a <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> um, I, but, but I will say the way that we did this work, the way that the way that the 20 person or just about 20 folks worked was that we were able to break into smaller groups to do some of that analysis and then come back as a larger group and have discussions. And so I think if we were to get any smaller, there wouldn't be, it wouldn't allow folks to really think through and process and break out groups um, in smaller groups. So that's, that's what I'll say about that. And then in terms of the committee makeup, um, that I, I think having folks at least see out, see through, um, you know, a, a set of actions and materials, right? So for instance, this group that we had, I think six months is far too short for, or however long it was, I think that's just far too short for people to say that they were on a DEI committee and were able to see change or, or see some next steps, right, happen or some shifts. Um, but I, I think a term limit like two years, I've seen that in other districts, is, is absolutely um, fine. Or even a year, or as people rotate off or fall off or as students graduate, may, and if they, you know, maybe if they stay in Scarborough, then they become community members of the, the board, um, or I'm sorry, the DEI committee, um, or you know, as other folks are interested. Um, but I, I think that term limits is probably a way to go with this. It seems to work because that gives folks enough time to see, you know, really be involved, right? And, and see their ideas come to life and, and then kind of move on and let someone else take over the reins. Thank you. Kristen, and then Leanne. I was um, hoping that you could talk a little bit about the type of person that would fill the role that you've recommended. Like what does the background of somebody in that position look like? What qualifications do they have? That's a great question. Now, I'm no way an HR uh, person or anything like that. Um, but what I've seen uh, really work is, is folks who have a passion and commitment for students. <laughs> And for families and communities and, and really supporting um, everyone involved in school districts, including educators, right? Um, and that they have a passion for this work, keeping students safe, um, creating positive school climates, and that they um, really are, uh, again, dedicated to ensuring access and opportunity and really dedicated to driving out um, whatever inequities, identifying those, driving them out, and really working to put together, put in place um, uh, action steps or uh, strategies to help uphold equity and safe learning environments. And also someone who is a, a bridge, you know, a, a connector, a collaborator that has those skills. So no, no tall order at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but really it's, it's someone who believes in the work. I think that's the first thing, right? They believe in the work and they believe that um, equity and in, they, they believe that inequities may exist and that they wanna seek out what those are and do something about it. Just to, that, that's not a very pretty way to say it, but it doesn't plainly. Leanne? Um. Carmen, thank you for coming tonight. Um, really, it, this was very informative. I've got a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna try to like just keep them like together, lump together as I can. With respect to get, grab, getting new data or resurveying people, how do you aggregate that data with what you already have? Um, because we're gonna have people who have left the district, maybe come into the district. <laughs> the whole Zoom. Can you all, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. I think Leanne froze. Yeah. Yes. The story to the committee. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're, we're only laughing at you, Leanne, because you, we missed the whole middle and there's just the last three words. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your question was great though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try this one again. Um, as somebody who works with data, Carmen, how would you normalize data that you got eight months ago against data today to know that it's continuing or providing the level of details that you need 
without starting over from the beginning and recollecting all of the data over? Yeah, so that's a very, very uh, great question. And also as someone who <laughs> has a, a background in data analysis and research, um, I, you know, we keep in mind that, and we are very, you know, just say that this data it is collected in a snapshot point in time, right? So keeping that in mind, so when the surveys went out, we know we were in, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of perhaps virtual learning or figuring out how students were going back to school buildings. And so the data looks a certain way there. Um, when we would, what our suggestion is not necessarily do a climate survey again, but to do focus groups, um, to do a listening tour uh, or town halls, um, and again, uh, any of the number of those, those qualitative data collection pieces. And then knowing too that that is also happening in a, in a snapshot point in time. And keeping that in mind when we're doing analyses and, bring, and bringing in that data and mixing data to uh, make sense of what those experiences might be that students are having and that faculty are having and that families are having in the district. Um, but but not, you know, not making it seem like this was all collected at the same data point or same you know, time frame. So I think that's the first thing I would say to answer your question. And, then, and I think something else I would say too is um, with the aggregate, just with um, that qualitative data, thinking about the themes that may come out of that um, and thinking about what quantitative data may speak to those themes or um, from, so from the climate survey or if there's other data, like we said, looking at um, discipline data or attendance data or graduation data or um, promotion data or you know student to which students are in your AP and honors courses and you know things like that right um, to make sense to help make sense of student experiences. Okay. Um, when you're referring to the disaggregate review of the data, are there costs associated with that deeper dive into the analyses? So yes, working with us, so as I said, we operate a federally funded TA center, the Center for Education Equity. So we're able to do um, a, a, a large portion, I would say, of work through that center. Um, but we have 15 states and that many more dis districts in those states that, you know, for our services to, to, to work with. And so there is, a, there, there is a small fee associated with some of that work, the deep dive work. Um, especially with doing focus groups and, um, and analyzing those and that disaggregated data analysis, just because of the sheer level of, of resources that go into doing that work um, and, and planning that out and then doing those analyses. Okay. Um, and then I'll keep this to be my last question for now. Um, with respect to the committee and deter, you know, trying to, looking at replacing committee members, is it based on the individual's choice about whether or not they can continue um, with the committee? Yeah, it depends on their choice, whether or not they want to continue, or um, perhaps if it seems like uh, it's not in their best interest or student's best interest um, for them to continue. Okay. Thank you. Very welcome. Jaden, go ahead. I just, to your point, Leanne, if a teacher leaves the district, that would be teacher or staff member, that would be another reason to replace. Or um, as students, you know, leave and leave, leave the town as well. You know, graduate from high school and leave town. Okay, thank you, Shannon. Other questions and comments for Carmen? Kristen. Um, I had one more question about the focus groups. If we, if that is a path that we went down, would you be able to provide more information on how you form those focus groups? Yes, and um, excuse me, just to let you know, we um, work with districts on a recruitment plan and outreach plan to, to determine students, again, those different stakeholder groups that we wanna talk to. So students, staff, administrators, um, uh, parents, alumni, community members, you, you name it, who do you all think you would wanna work with? And then we work with you on that plan. We work with, uh, in terms of outreach, we also um, collaborate and co-construct with you the questions that we've asked. I mean, we have some questions that we've asked in certain, and with other projects and other clients, but we always want to make sure that we're asking the right questions that pertain to um, you know, your district 
And so we would do that. And we can we can talk more about that if that's something you'd like us to work on or if you like our feedback on selecting another group to work with. Other questions? Not seeing any, Carmen. Thank you so much for supplying us with the concise and informative slide deck and for taking the time to walk us through all of the committee's work and the committee's recommendations. Um, for board purposes, um, this is kind of our opportunity to have this free talk and to ask Carmen questions. Um, during the business meeting, it is an action item for us to discuss these recommendations. And at that point, if we would like to accept a motion or, you know, entertain a motion, then we can take formal action on them. So now is really the time when the bulk of the discussion should happen. If um, people want to continue the discussion, we can do that now. Um, but if you feel like you've had your questions answered, then we can dismiss Carmen. Nick, go ahead. Oh, convince me to ask another question. <laughs> go for it. Now is the time. This is our time. Um, so. so one of the notes I wrote down here as, as during your presentation that, that I'm thinking about, and I'm thinking about it not just through the lens of Scarborough, but through other um, organizations, educational organizations I've been involved in, um, where this type of work had launched or was started. And there were great things happening and there were challenging things happening. And so as we talk about this full-time position, I'm wondering, how does this position interact with organizationally um, the disciplinary side of the house? I see this position the way as you describe it as an advocate for this work, which I think is so critical and important for all the populations that um, could benefit from it. But I'm wondering, how does, the, how does it interact with the disciplinary structure at the schools and across the district and, and different investigations into incidents that occur? Um, because, of course, I'm sure, and I'm dancing around it, but I'm sure, I'm sure you know what I'm getting at, that there, there can be challenges sometimes if this work butts up against and, and causes challenges in the structures that exist. And so it's really meant to complement and enhance that work as opposed to stand in opposition to it. So I'm just wondering from your experience as we think about establishing a position like this, how do we build it in a way so that it complements and supports the structures and leaders that we have? That's a really great question. Um, so the first thing that I think of is ensuring that, I mean, and you kind of answered it as you were asking your question, was ensuring that um, someone in this position is has a seat at the table. So. Um, what I suggest, and, you know, and I don't know how this works, but one of the things that I've seen is that that person reports directly to the superintendent. Um, and so they're, they're on the same level as your other, your directors of this, your directors of that, if you will, um, or assistant superintendents of this and that. They're on whatever level and they have that direct line to the superintendent because that communicates the importance of the role and the importance of the work. And then they work in collaboration with, in some districts, it's the curriculum instruction, you know, or teaching and learning or um, student support services. And they all, that the equity coordinator or whatever you want to call it, um, let's say the grand poobah of equity for now, um, is, on, uh, is on committees and is brought in to help develop the work of those other offices. Um, but they're not in a silo. They shouldn't be the only one that's doing equity work. They shouldn't be, oh, well, that's Carmen's job over there. If it's equity, send them to Carmen. Like that's not how it should look at all. It should really be um, a, a coordinated effort and a coordinated approach. Um, and again, I, I, I see it in other districts where this person is in the superintendent's capital and, and that's how it's communicated. No, I, I think that's great. And you answered my question very well. And I, one of the things that I was really glad to hear you say is that, you know, this position is not meant to be a container for DEI work to happen. It really is everybody's job. And it really is this person's kind of function uh, and reporting to the superintendent. I mean, that sounds reasonable to me. I mean, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but I'm glad to hear you describe it as a, as an advocacy position that helps everybody see the importance and the overall integration of this work. It doesn't just become a a convenient side office that we can push all these issues into. That's really important. Thanks. Yeah, well, that's the opposite of what we want to see. <laughs> I'll just piggyback off a next question. And, and I think one thing that comes to mind is that, you know, we kind of, we build this as a really like a community survey and, and project. And I think you're right, right. It does make sense for that position to report 
to the superintendent, but have you ever seen it work where you have a single role for a town? So someone that was responsible, not just for the uh, DEI within the, the school district, but also the greater community at large. There are a few towns and cities that are starting to have um, directors of equity that report to mayors or you know, to, to some person in you know, that, that particular office. Um, there uh, or chief equity officers, if you will. So I have seen that um, with different uh, cities. Again, outside of, you know, I don't say outside of education, but larger than just education that's helping to direct and drive the work. And then that person helps coordinate efforts across education, health and human services, whatever other agencies that exist in governments um, and helps drive policy work and um, analysis of policy, looking at everything through an equity lens and ensuring that citizens, um, constituents, you know, stakeholders um, have, are, have what they need and, and feel safe and secure and um, that there are equitable practices happening across towns and cities and districts and states. So I have seen that. Um, and I have seen it where in school districts, there's uh, a coordinated effort for um, again, the equity poobah, if, if you will, whatever you want to call that person in Scarborough, and then someone like that in a, 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 the mayor, or you know, I don't know if like my town has a county executive. I know it's different everywhere, um, but whoever that happens to be, that's kind of running things. Okay, thank you. Well, I, are we having a discussion about this, or just questions still? <laughs> I'm gonna put. I do actually have one. Go more for it. That I realized I had about it was recommendation three. So, I, I guess I'm wondering because you said teaching learning opportunities for many different groups according to best practices, but I will admit I don't know what those best practices are. Like, is there? Can you talk a little bit more about what sort of materials would be used? What is considered best practice? And I guess I just don't really know a lot about what we would be offering as learning opportunities for parents and teachers and students. So um, from our, um, I guess, vantage point, and this really would depend and determine on the, be based on the data. So the climate survey data, again, as well as any focus groups or um, interviews or anything that we see in terms of data analysis of quantitative data sets. But in general, some of those uh, topics could be just as basic as what is equity? What is educational equity? Um, what is cultural responsive practices? What does it mean to create safe and positive school environments for students and faculty and parents? And um, what's culturally responsive family engagement, um, implicit bias, microaggressions, privilege, uh, all these different things, structural racism and how it enacts and, and kind of forms and manifests in school districts and in systems and, and going from there. But the, the point of that is to kind of elevate and ensure that we're all broadening our horizons, but also to offer to, uh, a space where folks can talk and discuss together and learn together across these different topics um, because that's where the shared knowledge happens, right? So this one was more about doing that training across the district and with the DEI committee and possibly even the Board of Education and whoever else you all would believe would, would, would benefit from it, but have holding space to, um, to uh, build capacity for certain, these certain topics data-driven decision-making. We spent a lot of time with the, with the DEI committee, as I shared, talking about data-driven decision-making. And that's a huge thing, right? Because you wanna make sure that decisions are based on sound analysis and um, spending time talking about what that looks like and what are different models and methods for that. Um, so, I, I mean, I'll stop there. I mean, there, but, and then each of those, right? There's different levels to, to those topics as well, but that would be kind of the starting place. Is that something that you and your group would do, or is it we, something that our administration would do? Absolutely, and we we can train like staff members directly, 
We've also developed for several school districts now a train the trainer model where we work very closely with um, representatives from different buildings. So it could be the principal or the principal's designee, sometimes guidance counselors and work very closely with them in groups and then um, and, and work with them and train them and then work with them to develop content for training that they would then turn around in their buildings. But we also um, do direct training with staff across, you know, all, you know, all staff in districts um, and students as well, uh, because I think as, as students are, you know, we're doing this work with and for students, but we also want them to, to have some sort of um, knowledge and capacity building as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, if I can, for a second, um, turn it over to Jeff and ask if you would share a little bit about any of your previous experience or how you think what we've heard tonight can kind of dovetail with some things that you've seen done in other districts, kind of just bring us home here and, and tie this up maybe with. Sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm new here. <laughs> very nice to meet you. And a very I'm, no, no, no. It's very nice to meet you as well. I know it's, it's fascinating just to listen to these recommendations. We've, um, we've had a very active an, uh, inclusion committee in place for a little over three years now in Falmouth, which is next door, which is where I'm coming from. And, and I've, I've been the superintendent there for the last seven years. So we do not have um, a, a single position, someone in charge of the work. Uh, as a full-time position. However, there's been a lot of capacity building um, with, with our teachers and staff, also with our kids. We had a very, we've had a very active committee that's also done a lot of uh, review of curriculum and materials and, and books from anywhere from kindergarten all the way up through the high school. Um, so there's been a lot of work that's been done. Um, and, and it's, it's been a, a lot, I think it was, it was just interesting to look at the list of recommendations where you've got the position as number one and then two, three, and four, which is a lot of digging in more, getting more information um, from stakeholders, starting to build capacity, thinking about, we also have uh, equity response teams in each building as well in my previous district that um, we're just starting to really connect, okay, what are we doing in the classroom with kids? How is this functioning in the, how, how are these issues playing out and what we're teaching and how we're teaching it? And then how kids are feeling in terms of um, uh, in inclusivity. And it's a similar uh, demographic as Scarborough where um, you may not have on the surface anyway, as much diversity as, as it is actually there. So I guess I, I was thinking of like the chicken and the egg, what comes first, right? And you alluded to this as well with the position. Do, you know, can you start, because the, the other recommendations, the ones where you're digging more into the data and, and, and really trying to educate, what does this mean? What, what does a culturally responsive classroom look like? How are issues of harassment really dealt with at the building level, all that kind of thing. That work can, can be done, you know, I mean, it's, you don't stop, right? All the kids are here, right? And when these issues are real and they've been happening and they continue to happen, so, Let's move the work forward with the recognition that we also can't snap our fingers and, and have, a, have a position and someone hired in that position, right? So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, um, what are some, you know, I read you as saying a lot, of, a lot of these recommendations that aren't necessarily the position. You don't need the position in order to start working on all these other things. So I'm seeing you nodding, nodding your head, so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was saying absolutely, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then it's like, you know, as far as not, not looking at these recommendations as a, as a, even though they're numbered, right? Like do this and then do this and do that, or it necessarily is even implementation, right? These are a list of recommendations from the committee of where this work should, should turn their, you know, where should, we should turn some of our attention to. So I guess I would just caution um, the board in terms of, you know, if, approving a list of recommendations, what these are. This isn't a plan. These, these are lists, lists of recommendations that bear a whole lot more uh, scrutiny. And in talking with some people who, who, were, who were on the committee as well, you know, sometimes you start digging into this and you have a lot more questions than you have answers, at least initially. And that's where I feel like this committee work has, has landed. Um, but then again, I'm new here, hi. <laughs> Those have been my initial impressions. 
Does anyone else have any final questions or comments for Carmen or for members of the DEI committee? I'm not seeing any. Carmen, thank you so much again for your time and for your presentation and you know the work continues. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank Take you, care, everyone. At this time, it is 6.56. We can go ahead and recess for five minutes and then reconvene for the business meeting at seven o'clock. <laughs>
Um, but we can skip the attendance and um, the pledge because this is a continuous stream online. Um, and really we just recessed from our previous workshop. So tonight is Thursday, July 15th, 2021. And this is the regular meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. Um, agenda item 4.0 is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to see? Uh, no adjustments. Thank you. Uh, agenda item 5.0 is public comment on agenda items. There is no one in person to make public comment. I will check the Zoom feed really quickly here. Not seeing anyone. So I will go ahead and with that, close public comment this evening. Agenda item 6.0 is the superintendent's report. Hi. Hi, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff Bruno, I'm new superintendent of schools here in Scarborough. Officially started July 1. Um, I thought I'd just share a few slides kind of where, just to kind of share a little bit uh, about myself and where my head is at right now. Um, I just, just a quick thank you to everyone who's just been so welcoming. So everyone in this from central office to administrators I've met um, this spring, I actually got the opportunity to, to sit in and one of the first in-person um, leadership council meetings, which was great. I get to introduce myself and, and get to know people. Um, my office is set up, so there was some work getting done in the, on the second floor of, of this building, and um, and it's it's great. I have I, I have my first standing desk, which is very exciting. So it's it's I think, very high. Like, I think I think inordinately I think, I think high. Kelly almost whacked her forehead on it <laughs> when it was in standing mode. <laughs> but uh, so that's pretty cool. I don't I don't like to sit a lot, so that's that's helpful. Um, I also have two whiteboards. So I actually the first slide I I. Uh, I took pictures of, of, of two whiteboards now, which is great. I've always had one big one in my office uh, for many years now as an administrator. I think, I think um, my first position as, as a principal, um, I was missing the classroom so much. I'm like, well, I gotta have a whiteboard in here and at least right, feel like I'm, I'm doing, doing something uh, education related. So um, it really became, the whiteboard in, in my office anyway, became kind of uh, a place where I would have big picture kind of core value stuff, also, a lot of times write, um, you know, a list of priorities on the board. I always found it interesting that, that when people would come into the office, um, it could be a student, it could be a staff member, it could be anybody that they kind of come in with an agenda or something on their mind or whatever it was. And then they'd look up at the board and it would kind of stop them for a second. And it could be something, you know, a, a detail that we needed to do next week or whatever. And they'll just comment on it. And it, it was just a way, a, a conversation starter, but then also a mechanism for people to feel connected with um, what we're thinking about or what I was thinking about. A couple of the quotes that are on my kind of core value and vision boards have been on my whiteboard for close to 15 years. Um, others I add and, 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 and things kind of come and go, but, but the core values uh, stay. So uh, I shared some pictures of, of where my core value board is right now, um, took it today. And then the second board, which is on the other wall, kind of cool, is that's going to be the, the list of priorities and to-do lists and other things board. Um, so it's it's fill, <laughs> filled up pretty quick and, and it continues to and, and just kind of, um, you know, where my head is at, at least for, you know, the, the first few days, first few weeks, this summer. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think we're in a, in a phase where, where everyone's looking forward to bringing everybody back on school campus full time feels like a restart and, and it would if I were in uh, my previous district as well. So it's a kind of a uni unique moment in time, I think right now coming out of what was um, such a crazy year, a uh, year and a half really. So um, I'm really excited to, just to get started. And um, so a few of the things uh, that I wrote in the second slide is, is kind of, you know, where we're at. So I've um, attended our first central office leadership uh, team meeting that was on Tuesday of this week. Um, summer programming is up and running. So uh, we got a report on extended school year program, both at Wentworth and the middle school. Uh, everything's off running smoothly. Um, summer academies, elementary and middle school, um, four and two week sessions that are happening in, in both of those buildings. And then the first high um, time we've uh, run a high school credit recovery program is also underway at the at the high school. I actually was chatting with um, with Sue about that uh, earlier today, 
uh, they have 40 students, at least 40 students that are involved um, right now in, in that credit recovery program. And it's, and it's been working great. And, and, you know, her initial reaction about it is, is some, an, an opportunity, and this is free for all students that are involved as well, is something that they would love to be able to offer in subsequent summers as well. So that, that was pretty exciting. Um, hiring process is proceeding. We had some, um, a couple of recent resignations. We have open positions, including a middle school librarian, a middle school instructional and technology coach, a K-2 technology coach, there are special services openings and the K-2 behavioral specialist as well. Um, we also have a central office receptionist uh, position that's been posted, uh, a maintenance worker position, and then we need bus drivers. So we're, and, and a, lot of, a lot of nodding heads, we're, we're seven or eight bus drivers short uh, currently right now, also offering a signing bonus. So I wanna publicly put that out there. Um, We'll, we'll, work, we'll work with you to, on, on a CDL license as well. I mean, we, we need people um, uh, for tra to transport and make sure that we can uh, get our kids to school. So that's, yeah. that's a, I'm just gonna put a nice public plug in for, the, for those positions. Um, and then, you know, finally, what's really, really on my mind right now and has been, um, you know, for a couple of months now um, are three things, listen, learn, and build team. So uh, that's where my focus is right now uh, with our leadership council, with, with um, the board, uh, with our staff. Um, I'm really looking forward to, uh, we're, we're gonna be hosting a two-day offsite leadership institute in early August uh, for our leadership council. Um, getting up to speed and setting priorities. So, so uh, we're having weekly central office leadership team meetings. Um, I'm also sitting down with, with as many people as I can one-on-one. -on -one. So I've started that already. I think I've got six or seven meetings deep and that's, that's leadership council, that's um, board members, uh, that's going to be town leadership as well. Um, trying to get as much of that done in the quiet month of July, <laughs> right? Which doesn't stay quiet for long. And then it, and I was talking with Sue about this a little earlier today in one of my hot seat one-on-one -on -one meetings. And she's like, yeah, you flip the switch on August 1st and all of a sudden it's like, game on. So I'm like, all right, I, I got I to I get to know people quick. Um, and then communication and outreach. So um, I want to thank Todd Jepson. He, he, uh, he put up with me for a little over two hours, actually, um, in, in his mobile office. Um, and we went to all buildings. I've walked through all K-2 buildings. I've walked through uh, Wentworth and the middle school and the high school as well. Um, he was a perfect person to, to give me those tours. Um, so that was great. That was, I, I learned a lot um, from getting into the buildings. And then, and then also um, starting to put together letters. There's gonna be a, obviously a lot of um, communication, uh, both to staff and to families about uh, coming into this fall, recognizing that, that obviously how unique this last year was and, and getting back to some full person in person, all that kind of stuff. And, and some of the, um, uh, all, the, all the different measures that we're gonna take to make sure that, that we're keeping kids safe and, and healthy as well as in, in school buildings. So, uh, and that's, that's really the, uh, the last bullet is, is continuing to, to do, you know, just to prepare as much as possible for full-time in-person instruction as well. And uh, welcoming everybody back onto the school campus, which I know everybody is really looking forward to. And that's my report. Excellent, thank you, Jeff. Not busy at all. No, nothing. Enjoying lots of days at the beach. <laughs> chair's report, agenda item, where are we? 7.0. Um, so for my chair's report tonight, I just have a couple of quick announcements. Um, if you could go ahead and advance, Diane, thank you. Um, first, we did. We had kind of tabled the decision for when we wanted to meet in August until um, I had had the opportunity to speak with Jeff and make sure that our schedules matched up. Um, we had the opportunity to sit down for an hour and a half. I took a lot of time on Wednesday morning. Um, and one of the things that came out of that was um, that if it's if it works and and everyone is amicable to it, I will peel you off the beach on August 19th at 7 p.m. Um, and that will be our August meeting. My next announcement, it's that time of year and it's like impossible to even believe this, um, but it's time to start thinking about our municipal elections. 
this year, the Board of Education has three three-year seats um, that will be open for election of a new member. And the town council, um, due to a recent resignation, has a one one-year seat in addition to two three-year seats. Uh, nomination papers are available in the town clerk's office on uh, beginning on Wednesday, August 4th. Um, and just for anyone who is watching who may not know the process for um, taking out papers or if you have any questions or you're feeling anxious, um, but you're considering running for any of these municipal seats, um, I know that I would be more than happy to speak with people who are interested, but I also know that um, the rest of my colleagues here on the board would be happy to speak too. So please consider running. We have a lot of vacancies. Next, um, a review of the board goals. <laughs> uh, I'm very proud that the board spent so much time developing these um, over the months of January and February. Um, I did want to remind everyone um, that, that has, it's been about six months since we developed our goals. I did send these to Jeff this morning or this afternoon um, so that he would have an idea of the work that we had kind of envisioned us doing um, back in January. Um, when I took a quick spin through them as I was posting them, you know, to make sure that we were on track with the work we were hoping to do, I feel like we're in a really good place um, with a lot of our goals, but it's always good to go back and make sure that, you know, all of those little things that we were hoping to do at the committee level um, are happening. And if they're not happening, are there ways that we can, you know, shift our work and adjust our focus a little bit to recenter us back on these goals? Um, the other reason that I I wanted to do a little bit of a refresher on our goals was because the board will need to do a self-evaluation. Um, the timeline for doing that is I will probably send out board self-evaluation materials mid-August um, and we will have plenty of time to fill those out. And then um, we will have an executive session in September to discuss um, our self-evaluation and kind of reflect on where we are and, and where we would like to go. Um, and at that time, we also, um, because we haven't had a permanent superintendent for a number of years, um, I would also kind of like to incorporate into that discussion um, an evaluation of the superintendent. And so we'll kind of bundle those things together. So that will be coming up in August and then kind of make its way into September. So my, for everyone who's a committee chair, um, I would appreciate it if you would go ahead and take a look through the goals, if not you know today, but uh, in the next couple of days and just kind of think to yourself like, where am I at with my committee and, and are we meeting our goals? That is my chair's report. Agenda item 8.0 is committee reports. Mm -hmm. This is Christine. Um, yep, as we all know, the budget passed, which was super exciting and that um, combined with the FY21 budget gives us the funds to start planning for a new combined school. Um, the building steering committee and the superintendent are going to partner with the town manager to work on next steps in the scope of work needed. So later on tonight, one of our agenda items is to authorize Jeff to enter into contract negotiations with an architectural firm, which won't happen anytime probably in the next week. But I, my thinking is that it would be nice as Jeff meets with Tom and they get going and have to decide what comes next, which most logically will be a site selection, that he's in a position to just move forward with that. Just as a review, Kristen, before we move on, um, and this kind of ties into the building steering committee, which we don't necessarily, do we have a separate slide for that? Am no. I jumping ahead? Okay. So if you don't mind, like, could you give us a quick, um, refresher on what was decided by the building steering committee up to this point? The building steering committee. So this was, they, I guess it was last spring, got up to the point of entering into a contract with a firm. Then COVID happened, budgets happened, and we sort of just stopped at that point. So the previous building, the building steering committee, which still exists as it is, but I'm new to it and Nick is new to it as well. Um, they did choose a firm, but have not actually negotiated that contract, which is why I'm not sharing who the firm is at this point. I think that's it. Okay. Is there more? Nope. That, that I, you know, I think it's good, especially for 
all of us in terms of remembering the timeline and you know the the building steering committee had recommendations um but to your point i think it it got stalled because of budgetary reasons yes but i think it's important for the board to remember that at this point we are not able to move the project forward really um until we authorize the superintendent to to enter into some kind of negotiation yeah all future things that are going to happen we really need a firm on board to help us do this work so the building steering committee is going to get the town council up to speed they are going to get tom hall up to speed as well but yeah we are at a stage now where we need a firm okay to sort of get on board thank you for setting the nick. stage for that nick i just wanted to add really quick um just to dovetail off exactly what Kristen just said which is that um the committee's actually met a couple of times to look at the presentation we gave the board a year ago and to see what's relevant from that presentation. What do we need to brush up a little bit? What do we need to enhance and kind of flesh out with 2021 information so that it's in a place where the town council can get a lot of their questions answered and hopefully we'll uh, get some support from that body. Yeah, I mean, and mostly a lot of people's remaining questions require the firm to help us answer yeah. those questions. Great, thanks. Negotiations. That one's me. Um, so I just want to give everyone an update on negotiations. As you know, these updates can be a little bit deliberately vague because negotiations is a special committee that uh, for any of our, anyone from the public that's watching that um, we, a lot of what we do is uh, confidential. But I did want to give everyone updates on where we are in the process. So to start, we've been working for a while now for several, several months um on the esp educational support uh, professionals contract there were three contracts that were up as of um the end of this uh academic year and so we're um we have filed for mediation help as of 623 um we're waiting to be assigned a mediator and once assigned we'll set up our first mediation um uh, appointment or, or meeting to bring that uh, contract hopefully to accord as expeditiously as possible at this point um, since then, the board has filed an official 10 day request to bargain the bus drivers contract that was uh, filed on the 29th of June. So just six days after we filed for mediation there, we really want to keep the process moving and the board is invested in ensuring that all of our doing everything we can to ensure that all of our employees have valid and current contracts when they come back to us to our full fall open year. So um, I just want to give everyone an update on that and we hope to set up that first uh, CBA session on the bus driver's contract very soon. Perfect. Thank you, Nick. DEI. I don't have much to say since we just had, had our workshop. So um, we had two meetings since we've last met. The first was in June, the end of June, where we discussed the last bit of the climate survey data um, using that data-driven dialogue that Carmen discussed with you. So we looked at the parent survey data, the staff survey data, and then we look through the open-ended responses um, across all three um, data points. Uh, the, the July meeting we, ha we had was to discuss the um, board recommendations. So we, we uh, did a consensus vote on that. So um, as a committee. To, to decide what would come forward to the board. And then we are now on summer hiatus. So we, we will not be meeting until the fall. Great, thank you. Liaison updates. Sarah, you are town council liaison. Cool. So mine is like a uh, town council slash finance committee update. And I think hopefully you guys saw the email, the good news from Kate about the governor's um, budget that was passed. And if you recall, when we were passing the budget, we also um, a pa passed an order that said, if the uh, additional budget came through, half of it would go basically to our, our taxpayer contribution. Um, and then half of it would go into a capital reserves fund. So that has happened, it passed. And at the town council meeting next Wednesday, they'll formalize it. Um, and basically that amounts to, uh, it's about $488,000 that'll go um, to the local contribution, which if you look at the projections, will make the increase anywhere from like 1.8 to two, some low 2% um, mill rate increase. So that's great. Um, and then there is a process that we have to go through setting up that capital reserves fund. Uh, it isn't urgent. So it is something that Kate said that 
we do need to pick up, but it can probably wait until the fall until we start to do that. Okay, perfect. Um, my legislative update dovetails with that conversation perfectly because my number one bullet is <clears throat> that the budget passed at the state level um, and that that means for us that 55% of the cost of education will be paid for by the state, um, which is outstanding news for districts. My, my other bullet is to um, highlight that LD 677, which was a resolution um, designed at retaining local control of um, collective bargaining, um, specifically for negotiating salaries, pensions, and insurance, um, was vetoed by the governor on July 14th. Um, individuals are encouraged by MSBA to contact to contact rather their legislators to uphold the veto. Um, and so I have sent my email um, to our representatives. If you need their contact information, if you're watching and you're not sure how to contact our um, state senator or our representatives, I'm happy to provide that information. Um, but this is something that you know um, the governor sees value in maintaining local control, and for that. Um, yeah, I personally am supportive and, and I know that that means a lot for um, local municipalities. And so hopefully that will be, that veto will be upheld. And that is all I have for a legislative update. Agenda item 9.0 is new business. Agenda item 9.1 is approval of the DEI steering committee recommendations. So I gave a considerable amount of thought into um, how to navigate this portion of the meeting, uh, just because the list of recommendations is pretty lengthy. Um, I think that based on the workshop that we had um, and just some discussions that I've had with individual members and with the superintendent, um, that it probably is better if we um, entertain motions on the recommendations um, individually, mm -hmm. rather than trying to bundle them and, and accept all of the recommendations. And so for the purposes of um, being able to facilitate the, the meeting, uh, is there a motion to approve, and, and I'm, I'm sidestepping myself here by asking if there's a way that we can share, um, Diane, the doc, um, or even just the slide deck with the individual recommendations on them, I think that would be very helpful. Perfect, thank you very much. So is there a motion to approve recommendation number one, create a full-time FTE K-12 diversity equity and inclusion position within the district? So moved. Second. Discussion? Sarah. Um, I think it's a great recommendation. I think to Jeff's point, I don't know if it's something that's gonna happen right away, but I think you know, proving it signals our intent and um, desire to continue this and, and recognizing that this isn't just like a, a thing that happens once. It's something that is systemic and that we want to you know approve for the district for a long period of time, I would be interested in exploring whether this was something that could be elevated to like a community level. Um, I don't want it to get to not to get bogged down and then not happen because of that, but it just would be an interesting conversation if that's something that they're also exploring. You know, could we match the two together? But yes, I do support this. Other comments, Alicia? I just wanted to um, let you know that this was something that the committee had resounding approval for and um, everybody was in agreement and it seemed as though um, people really recognized the need for this position. Thank you. Other comments? Katie, Kristen. I think first I have a question of if we approve these, like how much of a commitment is this approving these recommendations? I think that that's a very appropriate question. As written, this recommendation makes me nervous. Yeah. Um, I would like to see the position go through the normal development budget development process um, where this is 
put out with any other proposal for a new position, just like we would um, at the beginning of any FY budget, fill in the year budget development. Um, and so as written, I feel like this is um, more definitive and kind of implies that this is something that we are directing the, the creation of now. Um, but that's my interpretation of, of how this is written. That's sort of my interpretation of it too. And I think that makes me a little bit nervous because I feel like I would like to see more of the results of the data before we know what, I mean, I don't, it's a brand, it would be a brand new position and I'm having a hard time wrapping around my head what that position looks like without knowing where our greatest need is gonna be. Like it just, I don't know, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to do it now without really knowing more about what our needs are. Leanne and then Alicia and then Nick. Thanks guys. Um, I would agree with that about putting this through the normal policy or process of um, new positions coming through finance. But I'd also like to give the new superintendent an opportunity to weigh in on what the role would look like, where it's something, a new position that's going to report into his office. Um, is there an opportunity to wait until next cycle for this and find room in other people's um, daily workload to start this work, important work now, um, but not create a full-time position without giving him an opportunity to do a true audit of what his team is doing today. Alicia? Well, I can tell you that um, it's scary to hear some of those comments not in support of this position because as, um, after sitting on that committee for months, I think that um, the resounding position that everybody in the room was that this is a necessary position. And um, I don't need the data to um, recognize that if one of our students has faced discrimination or bullying because of their circumstances, and we have an opportunity to fix it based on a committee that we've charged to make recommendations that this will do a service to our entire school population. Um, we had these discussions in the committee, um, including funding. It's my opportunity, my um, understanding that there is the potential for, um, for some funding to um, staff this position. We're aware of circumstances of bullying and harassment and discrimination in our school system. And for recommendation one, to, to, for us to take a position where we say, let's, let's hold off and see if we really need it. I feel like that's complacent and complicit in allowing discrimination and harassment to continue in our schools. And it's something that I would never stand for. And, um, and it's there. And, and, and I hear people in our community say, I don't know if we really need this. I'll tell you we need it. I heard from students daily telling me how much we need it. We saw comments from the, the survey with people telling us that we have problems. It may not be our, you know, nearly homogenous community, but that's what makes it, in my, from my perspective, even more dangerous. That, we are in nearly a, a homogenous um, community because those students who are, need somebody to advocate for them, they need somebody to push this work forward. Um, we're a community with you know, a high so socioeconomic status overall. And um, there are students every day that, that are facing that sort of um, lens when they're trying to access their education. The, we know that, that professional development is, uh, is an issue in trying to get enough professional development for, for our everyday needs, let alone the needs of um, something that we've overlooked for way too long. And I think if we're not, if we're not trying to help the people that need the help the most ever. 
Nick? So as I read the top statement, the word that jumps out to me as kind of a dictatum is create. And so I'm wondering if there might be a friendly amendment here that could make this a little more, um, <clears throat> keep the importance of it, because I agree with Alicia, the importance of this is, is obvious. And, and when Carmen was describing it to us in the workshop, I was so grateful that she described it as a position of advocacy, as a position that's meant to promote and help all the structures we have in place be stronger through the lens of equity. And so I'm wondering if this could just be, I don't want to use the term softened, but I'm going to, um, and say maybe we change create to design, because this position has to be designed. It can't just be thrown together and just create that position, go find someone and bam, they're here next week. Whether we have the funding or not, it would be irresponsible to do that. So I'm wondering if we do something along the lines of design a full-time position, blah, 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 within the district. Um, I don't know if you need to add anything beyond that, like for consideration or for prioritization. I don't know, but I feel like changing that first word to be more thoughtful, but still maintaining the importance of this might help it be more digestible. Because I, I agree with what people are saying. I, I don't want it, for the first couple of comments that we've had, actually all of them, I agree with all of them, but the first couple of comments I share that I'm concerned about it being like a, a directive from this committee that we're just gonna throw at the district without really fleshing out what that position could look like. Other comments? So, you know, I, I absolutely um, don't want to be uh, interpreted as not recognizing a need, um, but I do feel like um, the position itself um, is sort of a vague construct to me. Um, and just in terms of, is there a way to refocus our current resources uh, to address some of the problems that we have now, you know, to hear Alicia speak so passionately. And I know, um, you know, having served on this committee, um, shapes and, and informs and all of those things and I appreciate you bringing that um, to the meeting and so that we can all understand your experience from the committee. For me, you know, sitting and looking at this on paper, um, this seems, this, this just seems like a recommendation that would come out of a committee that has an expense associated with it would normally go through a budget process. And that's kind of, that I'm, and it's not about not addressing a need. Um, so I'm certainly recognizing that, you know, recommendation number one is absolutely to address the, the need. Um, I'm just not sure how to justify in my own mind, um, you know, if a separate committee came to us with an out of bud cycle, budget cycle request, how do we prioritize requests? Because we are putting ourselves in a position where maybe other people who have a a need would like a new position and, and they don't have the same opportunity to present to us. And, and, you know, I think that that, I think it's our job to really carefully think about the big picture and not just the committee recommendation in isolation. Sarah. I, I was thinking about that when we were in the workshop and I, I didn't say anything because I, I think we we're running the risk right now of getting a little too far ahead of ourselves and getting too in the weeds. I, if you kind of take the, what the recommendation is, right. Uh, you know, let's say it's a gym teacher. We're recommending a gym teacher. Well, that's a little less vague, right? We all know what that is, but it would still, the you know, Mike could make the recommendation. We say, yeah, that sounds good. You still have to go through the process. Mm -hmm. So just because we're approving this recommendation doesn't mean we're circumventing our normal process. It just means we're accepting the recommendation and we'll follow whatever the steps are that we follow, including writing a job spec, doing all these things. And ultimately if there's a budget for it, there's a budget for it, um, but maybe there is. And so I, I guess I would just, I, I think you're, the concerns that you've raised are valid, but I, I do not think that we shouldn't accept the recommendation on the basis of process that we know will happen. Yeah, Shannon. Um, I just wanna say, I'm not sure that um, 
taking positions that we currently have in the district or taking teachers or staff and asking them to add this on to what they're doing is the right answer either. It definitely takes away from the importance of this position and the value that we as a district see in, in having this position. So I would not advocate for that. And I, I agree completely with what Sarah says. As we, us, us saying, yes, we, we agree with this recommendation is that we agree to go through the proper procedures. We're not just, Jeff's not going to find someone tomorrow and we have a brand new employee, right? There's still a process that has to, we have to follow and the district has to follow. Leanne? Um, if we are going to follow the process and that makes me feel a whole lot better, thank you, Shannon. Can we go back to Nick's friendly amendment about the design instead of create so that it is very clear that this is going to be create the job spec, create the postings, go through the budget process and be very clear about what the role is going to do? Is that something that you guys would entertain? Alicia? So um, Diane was uh, on the DEI committee and I think, um, you know, she was engaged in, in a lot of those conversations. I don't know that I feel the need as a board member to sort of micromanage that part of it. I, I think that, um, and you know, Jeff's had experience in developing a, a DEI program himself to the extent that working with the HR professionals in the district, to the extent that um, they have a need for clarity, I'm sure they could seek out um, MAEC to, to help develop that. Um, I think it's just, it, and, and we had conversations about, you know, I had some concerns about making sure that it's the right fit because I think it could be, you know, not contrary to, to sort of what we're trying to accomplish if we don't find somebody who's really competent or, or able to lead that work. And so, um, you know, I certainly don't want to just push it and make it happen immediately. I think that the first thing that we need to do is recognize that we have the need for this work, um, authorize the creation of this position, and then leave it to the district to sort of develop it. And it may be a work that's ongoing as the recommendations flow in and as the data comes in and as they attend and participate in, in the, the building level discussions, you know, they may have conversations that, that sort of reveal um, how that could morph. I, what I what I do think is that um, I heard a lot of information about this needs to be really like a specialized position that's really important. Um, it needs to be a dedicated position that's really important. We know that um, our staff do wear many of them wear many hats and and work so many hours. So in in order to really accomplish what needs to be accomplished, I think that it's it's important that we create, design, develop, whatever you want to do, and then just leave it in the hands of um, our administrators to, to go from there and, and um, consider the feedback. And if they need additional guidance from the board or the, the committee, I'm sure they'll, or the experts, I'm sure they'll seek that out. Nick. So this could be a little bit of a challenging question, but I, I do want to ask something of the folks that have been on this committee. So <clears throat> the way this is written, we've talked about it. We've talked about process, and I think we're all feeling a little more, at least from my perspective, I feel like we're all feeling more comfortable about the fact that this has to go through the process that we have established. My question to all of you is, is the way this is written, and I ask this because I've been involved in advocacy work, in different flavors myself, and I know how passionate and empowering that work can be. Do you feel that people on the committee are expecting that if we approve this, it's going to show up on September 1? No, I okay. don't believe that. But there, there is a, a lot of discussion about the process. And, and, they, and I should be clear too, they, I, I don't believe anybody on the committee thinks that they should be the ones hiring this role, hiring for this role, creating a job description, or being involved in the process whatsoever. They recognize the, the proper channels for that. Um, no, and I, th I think that they, 
it's recommendation number one, because quite frankly, this was the one that they felt was the most important and the biggest thing that this district needs. That's why it fell in number one spot. Um, and again, it's to April's point, it's different when you're sitting in the committee and you're hearing stories and you're seeing real life examples and you have a little bit of a different lens that you're looking at this through. But um, I think that they're also real, they had, they're realistic about it. They understand what, what this actually means. Yeah, that's, that's good. And I asked because I know it was an uncomfortable thing to ask and I'm glad you answered it so directly because I agree with you. I think that of all the recommendations that are there and I work in data analysis, so I love data and all the things about data are great. But number one, this is the most powerful and most potentially transformative recommendation you have here. And so I think that's really exciting. I just, I just wanted to be sure the committee understood the ramifications of approving it tonight is not a direct path to immediate implementation. Thank you, Nick. Um, I admittedly lost track of whose motion it is. Who made, you did. and I said, is there a motion? And then someone said, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, I don't like believe I did, but thank you. <laughs> so 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 with that in mind sarah do you accept the friendly amendment um to change the word create to design yes okay and so what we are voting on it seems like we if there's no more discussion is design a full-time fte k-12 diversity equity and inclusion position within the district and i believe we're ready to vote mrs giftis Mrs. Giftis? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Really good discussion. Thank you. Um, recommendation number two. We have 2A and then A through B, C, D, and E, or no, just D. It's just D. <laughs> yes, therefore. Okay. And of course, like, you know, I always think, how am I gonna facilitate these conversations and keep the meeting orderly? And then when I'm actually doing it, I'm like, oh, you know, what would have been really helpful is if I had, created a slide for us with just all of A, B, C, and D on one slide. Because I think um, for those of you who are able to pull it up in front of you, um, recommendation two, I don't think needs to necessarily be broken down by A, B, C, and D. I think we can improve this kind of general sense of gathering additional data. Um, and so do I have a motion to approve recommendation two, A, B, C, and D? So moved. Second. Discussion. Kristen. I think it's a very similar question to what I had with one, is what kind of a commitment in the, is this? Because there is a financial investment in this piece of it as well. And some determination to be made about who's gonna conduct focus groups and all of that sort of stuff. So. I'm, I'm a little hesitant just because we don't know what that financial commitment is and those sort of details to it. Okay. Other comments, Leanne? Oh, you had your hand up, but you put it down. Um, it was because it was the exact same question that Kristen was asking about what is the, what is the cost that we're signing up for with this recommendation? Go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Um, the 2A, the, the desegregated data, um, we had spoken as a committee actually about just doing that among ourselves, creating a subgroup, a subcommittee that would do it. Um, so that would be no cost. There would be no cost to that. Um, I think where we get into some of the costs of the um, focus groups, but she did, um, Diane and Alicia, correct me if I'm wrong, didn't Carmen say, that we could, she, they would direct us if we wanted to conduct it um, 
if we wanted to if we wanted to run these programs ourselves they would kind of direct us on how to do that if we chose to to do this without incurring any additional costs from them I, i'm asking because i i'm not recalling that part of the conversation i, I think the the piece that i do recall is you know if we take a look at the four sections under 2 a a through d mm -hmm. A to C are ones that we have the capability to do internally. And I wonder, um, you know, given the huge potential value that we could get from focus groups or listening tours, might it be worthwhile for us to look for funds to have that done by those folks who are outside experts? Well, I would certainly agree with that. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, the other thing too, the other piece of information that I, I know Carmen mentioned, but these, all of these recommendations, gathering this additional information is going to allow us to engage with people we didn't hear from. So th at the high school level, for example, we heard from very, we, we received very minimal responses and it was, it, we would like to hear from some more some other stakeholders within our community that we didn't hear from and this would give us that opportunity so i believe yes it is a worthwhile investment to get um to find the funds to do these projects Alicia, i, I guess i just view this i think sarah's first one to sarah's comment on the first recommendation is really um, helpful in clarifying it and i think we can view the, the number two recommendations in the same light that we um that we approve it and if if you know if there's a cost associated that the district can't swing um, can have further discussions or, and it doesn't necessarily need to occur right now i mean the hope is that it would but um you know it's not like we don't interact you know and so i i, I think that those are not insurmountable discussions. Alicia, can you turn your microphone on? I'm having a wicked hard time hearing you. Sorry, I thought I did. I might have turned it off. I, I, I just said that. Um, I, I'm sorry about that, Leanne. Uh, I just said that um, I view this recommendation as I would recommendation number one. And that's, you know, we approve it. And we hope that that's something that the district can fulfill. And, and um, I'm sure that there will be interactions between our groups if, you know, the, the school system and, and the board, if, if that's, you know, something that's a cost issue and we can, you know, determine how to move forward if it, if it becomes an issue. But I view this sort of as identifying it as a need and um, really, really highlighting the, you know, the fact that we are committed to the work and then um, somehow our, our district makes things happen. You know, they, they, they pull the money together and, 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 and I always am amazed at how that happens. And so I, I just have faith that that's something that will occur. Kristen. Um, I do see a lot of value in the focus groups. I don't want that to be misinterpreted at all. I think they probably would offer incredibly useful data. I think I would feel better, and I, I mean, we can find money, but that money does always come at the expense of something else. We don't have unlimited resources. So I guess maybe I would feel better if we had some ballpark or some understanding that the board would at some point learn what this cost was and where it's coming from how it's being funded, just more details. Other comments? Um, I'll, I'll add my two cents, which is, again, just from a procedural standpoint and from a budgetary standpoint, I have a hard time taking off that hat, um, you know, not really having an understanding of what the uh, monetary um, implications of what we're voting on, it feels, um, you know, just a little uncomfortable for me, if I'm being honest. Um, and not because, again, not because I don't feel like this work needs to be prioritized, but just here again, 
you know, in trying to make sure that we are maintaining our role as the board, we have this board committee um, and it puts the committee in a position to make monetary requests that other committees or other administrative led groups, um, you know, don't necessarily come to the board. That being said, we as a board, you know, to Alicia's point, don't get into the nitty gritty of where every line item dollar is spent. You know, we approve certain funds um, and we build our budget around what we think. And if the board directs, so from a, from a uh, standpoint of directing our priorities, this feels very good. Um, it's just a little uncomfortable because I, we don't know what the actual costs associated with it are. And, you know, I just wouldn't want to overstep and say, we, we feel really good about this. And then come to find out it's significantly more money than I even could imagine. I, mean, I do think Carmen said it was a small fee. So I think we're probably <laughs> exaggerating, spending too much time on this in terms of the cost. I also would say that we have an example, right? The building steering committee. We said, yeah, go ahead. We recommend like, go do these things, go do this work and then come back to us when you have something for us to yeah. sign, which like this would be a little bit different, but I, I think all we're doing is saying, yes, we accept the recommendation go forth and, and figure it out. And if there are, if it's cost prohibitive, let's have a conversation about it. Okay. Sarah, so always just so rational and reasonable. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm naive, I don't know. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Leanne? Um, it kind of goes with what Sarah said. I would be more comfortable if there were guardrails around the cost. Um, a nominal fee, what is nominal? Is it $5,000, is it $25,000? Um, I agree that Kate works miracles on how to come across money, um, but it's an uncomfortable spot to ask her to create this. The piece that I'm struggling with the most, being somebody who is a data person, it's really hard to move forward. If you're missing critical information, the committee needs this. So to say no is hampering the work of the committee, but from the finance side of it, it just helps to know at what point do you come back? Is it, is it a carte blanche that you, that we're just saying, go ahead and do this and we're okay with that and we'll make, we'll find the money someplace. Are there grants that we can request or apply for to help offset some of the costs? Um, just really curious about that. I don't want to belabor the point, but like nobody has carte blanche. <laughs> like that's just not how we do things here. And so like this isn't any different. And so I, I don't think we should treat it any differently. Diane, thank you. Sure. I would just also add um, as a point of information, we've had two facilitators from MAEC working with us since March for zero dollars. Um, all of their work has been um, at no cost to date. And then as a second point, it may be possible that we can leverage some title funding, um, perhaps as I look to Monique. Um, because as we consider this work, it really does fall under safe and inclusive schools. And so um, might it be possible to be creative in looking at that outside of a budget line? And I don't have the answer, but it's a wonder I have. It's a wonder. Fair enough. So I think, hmm? do you want to go again? I have a question. It's completely, go for it. completely un unrelated to the cost conversation. No worries. Um, it. It's, I guess, and I don't, I'm wondering of the committee, are you guys, and this is really not specific to this committee, but in general, like, are you guys planning to do another survey? Because I'm sort of starting to get a little concerned about the volume of testing and surveying and that kind of stuff that we're doing with students mm -hmm. and the time that it's taking to do that. And I'm just wondering, I guess, if it's on your radar. And if you don't know, you don't know, but I guess more put it out there as <coughs> In the back of my mind, I'm starting to have a little bit of concern about that. Um, it is not on our radar right now, no. It's more um, trying to offer other opportunities to get data that don't involve 
surveying again. Great, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Lost my train of thought for a second. No, that's okay. Um, so again, great conversation, great discussion. Um, I guess my request before I ask for the vote would just be that um, members of the DEI committee who serve the board, so Shannon and Alicia, um, just kind of be cognizant of board concerns around finances. Um, and so in supporting this work and wanting to support this work, I think, and being transparent about the work, um, you know, if there are costs and as there are costs, if those kind of things could be included in updates, um, I think that that would go a long way. Great, perfect. Okay, any other comments or questions? I think we're ready to vote, Diane, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Recommendation number three. Provide learning opportunities for stakeholders, DEI committee, administrators, teachers, parents, students, et cetera, in best practices in DEI and culturally, culturally responsive teaching and learning. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion. Kristen. <laughs> I hate starting it again. I know. Um, this one, Again, and Carmen was helpful in explaining to me some of it, but I think for me, I still have a very large lack of understanding about what these learning opportunities would be um, and who's teaching them. And again, maybe I am getting too into the weeds in it. I don't know, but I, I think this one feels super vague to me. And I don't, if you guys can offer me any more insight into it, I would appreciate it. Um, it is it is a little bit vague, I, I give you that. And that's because a piece of it is, um, we had a lot of discussion on really waiting for professional development and waiting for learning until we saw if amendment one or recommendation one passed, right? And if we hire somebody, letting them guide the work. However, there's still things we could be doing um, to, to teach, to teach our stakeholders, everybody that you see listed up there while we're waiting for that hiring to begin. But really what we're going to teach is going to come from the rest of the survey data that we collect. So when we have a better idea of our needs through the climate survey is one piece, but also the focus groups and the listening tours, when we have a better idea, then we can really say, okay, these are the lessons we, we should be teaching. These are the things that are needed. Okay, and when you talk about with students, is this classroom time or is this stuff that's just going to be incorporated into the natural everyday teachings? Like I, I guess I'm not understanding where students fit into this equation or if we're, if we're there yet, or if right now this is more of what Carmen said, train, train or let them. Well, I, I guess I, you know, I've, once again, I, I view all of, sort of the, the questions very, really the same in that, you know, we're identifying a gap after looking at the data and a need. And then we're, you know, saying to the district, here's, we've, the committee's now identified a gap and a need and um, can expect them to, to, to deliver it. And, and, you know, if they need more data, for, I think they'll, seek out the data from from the listening um tours or whatever you know whatever and, and um if that needs to be included in professional development i'm you know i i expect them to sort of it to be learning as they go and to be seeking out advice as they need it to be including this coordinator when that person is involved and and um so I think we're just at the beginning point. I think we're identifying the needs as identif as uh, from the from the data, and then administration will be 
you know, then filtering it down to, to the school level. Fair. Sorry, I'm leaning forward. Sarah, that's okay. I was just gonna provide a couple of examples because this learning is ongoing, right? And we have already started that process. A couple of great examples um, are at the K-2 level, our students had an author visit for Magnificent Homespun Brown, right? And that was really led by our high school civil rights team um, and, and those students. Similarly, they did a digital blackface presentation at the high school. Uh, they provided some professional development for our K-2 teachers. And so, you know, none of this work is really static. There's no one point in time where it's like, okay, we all know exactly what we need to do. Let's press play and start. Everybody is um, at a different place in this journey of growth. And our responsibility is to continue to provide some guideposts and some opportunities so that we can continue that growth together. Other comments or questions? Sarah? My only question was, is does this include curriculum updates? To, no, this is just like just strictly training of staff and teacher. Okay. Yes, this would just be strictly training. Um, we did not discuss curriculum reviews or curriculum audits. We have not even remotely gotten, gotten okay. there. Yeah. Other questions or comments? Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? No. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Great, thank you everyone. Recommendation number four, identify ways to increase stakeholders' understanding of SPS policies and practices for filing bully, bullying, harassment, discrimination complaints, and the district's appeal process. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion. Kristen. I actually really love this recommendation. Um, I, think it, I think that's a really important thing to do. And I think I would just add to that. I, and I don't know how this happens now, but just in general, making them also students aware of what those policies are, what the sexual harassment policy is, make sure they're well-versed in it and they understand what the expectations are of them, you know, as part of doing this and making sure they know where to go when there have been violations. Other comments? Shannon and then Alicia. Um, this is one that actually came directly from, we saw the immediate need through our climate survey data. So this is a really good example of where you can see um, see that, but through the, the comments like the, the, the one you see on the, on the white screen here, um, there is, seems to be, or there appears to be a lack of knowledge among everybody, students, parents, staff, community members, about what to do when they need to file a complaint and that there's also an appeal process that exists. So um, I, I just wanna, I appreciate that you really like this one, but I, and I do wanna just draw attention to that, that this is one of those examples where we saw an immediate, an immediate need. Alicia and then Yulia. So one of the things that we discussed at a workshop, and I don't even remember if it was for a goal or what, but like a year ago was, one of our concerns was sort of how um, building level concerns could be, could trickle to the superintendent, could trickle to the school board. And I think that this is really in line with that. I also, um, when I hear from people, I also wonder sort of what, what the experience is when somebody feels as though um, there's been an incident of, of bullying, harassment or discrimination at the school level. What, um, what the user experience is to, to those individuals. Um, because without that sort of express communication that they have the, sort of these rights and this is the process that's available, they're, they're um, subject 
somewhat to administration's interpretation of the events. And, um, and for, for, for individuals who could potentially be marginalized, I think that that could be dangerous. And so, and I'm not saying that like, like, you know, anybody's out there doing any bad things, but dangerous in terms of um, not treating people equally or not giving them a fair chance at, at accessing um, their rights in the same way that somebody who, who has um, access to other resources might. And so I, I really like that because I do think that it can, you know, it's one of the ways that we can really level the playing field and, and I like that. Great, Julia. Um, I'd just like to add that from a student's perspective, there's definitely no clear communicated like pathway for filing um, bullying, harassment or discrimination complaints. We're just generally told that guidance counselors are there if you need them or health teachers, really any teacher you could go to. But there's no really expressed clear policy or ways to do this. That's valuable feedback, thank you. Nick. I, I just wanted to ask based on um, the comment we just uh, had, um, I'm just wondering, is this something that needs to be clarified in the student handbook? Is there a student handbook? I'm totally speaking from a college perspective, but I'm just wondering <laughs> like, is this something that we need to clarify or promote in the handbook in some way? I mean, that, that's a great question. And, and you know, from a board perspective, I know there is a handbook. And again, that kind of goes down to administration and building level um, administration. And, you know, part of the, the fluidity of being able to kind of go from hearing from a student to a board member and having our administrators sitting right here is that this conversation is not going to be lost um, on our administration. So good. Any other comments or questions? Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? <coughs> yes. Thank you, everyone. Again, excellent discussion. Recommendation number five, reconvene the DEI committee in the fall to continue this work, including a process to onboard new members to replace any existing members who cannot or do not want to continue to serve. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion? I'll start this one um, <laughs> because this is logistically has been a challenge. Um, and we know as a board, you know, we, we've done a lot of development as a board this past year about committee selection and, you know, how to engage the community and, and how to go about doing that in a fair and transparent way. Um, we took some lumps and learned some hard lessons in the last year. Um, when it comes to committee formation. And so this one makes me um, a little squirrely um, because I don't necessarily see a clear path um, for how to do this at the board level. Um, we did, if you'll remember when we did the workshop with our legal console, um, we did learn that committee se selection certainly does not need to be a public process, um, nor would that be appropriate. Um, and that we could um, delegate individual members of the board um, to work on a subcommittee that was charged with committee selection. So that would be one possible path forward. Um, and again, we can absolutely approve this recommendation without having a plan in place. But this is one of those like, this is going to come up again relatively soon. And so while we consider this recommendation, I would just ask that board members kind of be considering um, if they have ideas for, you know, really what the path forward is for this committee makeup. People ask some great questions during the workshop about the committee make the current in its current form. And I think that that was really informative to the board um, in terms of um, the committee's ab ability to work and function. Um, and so I appreciate that. And so, you know, as we get ready to vote and, and consider this recommendation. Um, I think all of us understand that this is something that's gonna need to be addressed relatively relatively soon. Leanne. Um, I have two things. One, I know this is 
wholly out of order, but I'm going to have a question at the end of the recommendations. So I just want to make sure that I can ask my question after we vote on this. Um, Certainly. Thank you. The question that I do have though for the committee is how would you go about getting new members? Would it be based on people who had applied initially? Would you need to go out on a new search? Would there be regular searches to have people like in a, in a queue so that you could bring them on board if something happened and you needed to induct a new member to the committee? What are the plans to find you new members? I could tell you what I personally think, but I think that that, is, that decision as you're asking it is a board level decision. Um, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I'll, like, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you what I personally just think. Jump I, in. I don't, I'm not sure that it's, um, it's really for all of us to, to decide. Yeah, not just Alicia and I. Yeah, Leanne, to your, to your question, uh, I think your question I, I was attempting to address that preempt your question um, by, by pointing out that that's gonna be a, the development process for how we move that committee forward is gonna have to be a board discussion. Okay, sorry, but I saw it more as the selection itself, not how you would um, obtain the resume, so sorry. Sure, no, nope. I, I think it's gonna be a whole kit and caboodle. Other questions or comments? Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Oh my goodness, I thought there was another one. Okay. <laughs> Good job, everyone, working through those. Um, I hope that it was beneficial for everyone to go through those uh, individually. Again, thank you all for your um, thoughtful comments and, and discussion around those. Leanne, would you like to ask your question? Mm. No, she's there. Okay, I think I'm back. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about the data and I think it's awesome that you had an opportunity to look at it and really dig into it. As somebody who lives and breathes by analysis, is there an opportunity for the survey data to be shared with the board members? You actually have had it. Did you hear? Are you frozen? Um, I was thinking more in line. I don't, I don't recall seeing it. So I apologize for that then, Shannon. That's no worries. But yeah, um, I'll set, um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send it back to you. Thank you. And, and Leanne, if you have additional requests or um, if anyone on the board for that matter has additional requests for data that we haven't <coughs> seen, um, just shoot me an email um, and that, that kind of thing can go through the chair. And I will make sure that um, the committee, I mean, that the, what the committee, committee has has been shared with the full board. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Moving on to agenda item 9.2. Do I have a motion to authorize the superintendent to enter into contract negotiations with an architecture firm for the purposes of discussing next steps for a consolidated school building project? So moved, again. Discussion. Yeah. Uh, Kristen did a great job teeing this up for us um, in terms of what the need is. Granted, I was, you know, prodding the conversation maybe a little during the committee reports. Um, but for me, this is um, a formality um, that we were poised to, to carry through months ago. Um, and so, you know, I certainly feel good about, about this authorization. Nick. Yeah, I'll just say that, you know, my, my first tasks as a board member almost three years ago now was as the trailer king for our <laughs> portables, as everyone can remember. And so, and I also started as the chair for, for a couple of years of long range planning. So it's exciting to see this process um, kicking up again and with our new superintendent, permanent superintendent. Um, and so I could not be more in support of this and I never want to have to vote on a trailer again. 
you know, turn the AC off. <laughs> <laughs> People like them too much because of that. <laughs> Any further discussion? Kristen? I would just echo everything that Nick said. This is just, I think, a really exciting step, and we're excited to have you jump in and get this thing going. There we go. I think we're ready to vote. Great. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Leighton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Perfect, thank you everyone. Agenda item 9.3, I'm gonna bundle with 9.4 and 9.5. They are second readings of policies that we reviewed at our previous meeting. So do I have a motion to approve a uh, second reading of policy BDE, BBAB, and BBABR? So moved. Second. Discussion. And again, just for the public who may not have this right in front of them, these are policies related to our board standing committees, uh, student school board representatives, and student school board representation. I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Agenda item 9.6 is a Wentworth School donation and I will turn that over to Jeff. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really cool. I um, just wanted to highlight the, the letter that Kelly Crosby, principal at, at Wentworth shared uh, about Nathan. Uh, Nathan Clive is a former Wentworth student uh, who's now attending Baxter. Um, he's completing an Eagle, Skirt, Eagle Scout service project and has been working with the principal uh, as well as Todd, uh, our facilities director for a project proposal that will enhance the playground. So he's got, um, kiosk signs with Q QR codes actually as well to links to videos. Um, so not just the bullet points of, of how to be safe on, on each element, but also a video that will demonstrate that. So, um, and that's uh, the cost of the project, which will be funded through donations that he's coordinating will, will likely exceed $500. So I think this is just a great opportunity of, of kids giving back and, and um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the proposal. Um, that's part of his Eagle Scout project that he's currently working on. Do I have a motion to approve the donation? So moved. Second. Is it a, is it a donation now that I, now that I'm listening and I'm discussion, it is a, it is a formal donation that we need to accept. Okay. Thank you, Diane. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item 9.7, I'm gonna bundle with 9.8, 9.9, and 9.10. They are the meeting minutes of May 6th, 2021, the meeting minutes of May 20th, 2021, the meeting minutes of June 3rd, 2021, and the meeting minutes of June 4th, 2021. Do I have a motion to approve as presented? Second. Discussion. Thank you to Kelly for preparing all of those for us. Mm -hmm. I think we're ready to vote. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindsay? <coughs> yes. Mrs. Sider? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Agenda item 9.11 is appointments, and I will turn the appointments over to Jeff. All right, so we'll go through uh, some of these. Our first is a middle school science teacher, uh, one-year position. So Timothy Lyons has been chosen to fill this position. Uh, he's received his Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education from Gordon College. Uh, has been a sixth grade teacher in West Newbury, Massachusetts, and most recently a seventh and eighth grade science teacher in the Auburn School District. Uh, Mr. Lyons will be placed on 
step eight of the voucher scale for the collective bargaining agreement. Um, so the recommendation is to appoint Timothy Lyons as the middle school science teacher for the one year position. Uh, and then Blue Point, school special education teacher. I'm gonna confidently mispronounce Michelle Ciceri, who has been selected to fill this position created by a staff transfer. Did I get it right? Accessory. Accessory? <clears throat> I, I took a gamble. Uh, she, she's earned her bachelor's of arts degree in history from Western Connecticut State University, received her master's of science degree in education from the University of New Haven, uh, has been a functional life skills teacher in Portland schools, a lead special education teacher for both Easter Seals of Maine and the Shooting Stars program. Uh, the high school si uh, senior placement counselor, uh, Stephen Harris, has been chosen to fill this posi position uh, created by a resignation. Uh, Mr. Harris received his Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education from the University of Maine. He's earned a Master's of Arts degree in education from Goddard College in Vermont a master's of science degree in restorative practice from the International Institute for Restorative Practices in Pennsylvania, and plans to complete his educational specialist degree in 2022 from the University of Maine. So Harris has been a high school counselor at Massabesic High School, and most recently was the director of school counseling at Trape Academy in Kittery. Our K-2 music teacher, uh, Andrew Martell, has been selected to fill this position created by retirement. Uh, Mr. Martell obtained his Bachelor of Music degree from Vanderbilt University, where he also earned his Master's in Education in Instrumental Music. He's currently completing his second Master's degree from Vanderbilt University in Organizational Leadership. Mr. Martell was the Director of Instrumental Music at the Harpeth Hall School in Nashville, as well as a music teacher at Shabig Island School and Lyseth Elementary School uh, fun fact, he's also doing Thursday concerts with his band uh, on Cousins Island uh, over the summer. <laughs> so a little plug for those. Um, our middle school nurse um, position, Megan Croteau, has been nominated to fill this position created by retirement. Mrs. Croteau received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Health Education from the University of Maine in Farmington and her Master's of Public Health from Westchester University in Pennsylvania. She's accepted into the Accelerated Bachelors of Nursing program at USM, where she earned her Bachelor of Science degree in nursing degree. She's been a nurse in several different capacities at Maine Medical Center in Portland for several years. And our high school nurse, uh, Stacy Hang, has been selected to fill this position created by a realignment. Mrs. Hang earned her Bachelor's of Science in Community Health Education from UMF and her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from USM. She was a health teacher. Uh, to middle school students in both Gardner and Westbrook schools, practice nursing at Maine Medical Urology and at Barbara Bush Children's Hospital, and most recently has been a school nurse at Yarmouth High School. And then Eight Corners School Classroom Teacher, uh, Kate Griffin, has been selected to fill this position, created by a resignation. Mrs. Griffin uh, received her Bachelor of Science degree in elementary education from the University of Maine in Farmington. She taught a second grade classroom in Lewiston, for two years and has been a grade one, two teacher at Wyndham Primary School for the past five years. She's also a Scarborough resident and is, is um, looking forward to eliminating her commute. That's good. Um, high school RTI credit recovery support. Allison Lane has been chosen to fill this new position. Uh, Ms. Lane ob obtained her bachelor's of arts degree in psychology from the University of Maine at Orono. She received her master's degree in school counseling from Plymouth State University. She's been a school counselor at Central High School in Corinth since 2015. Ms. Lane will be placed. And that's that's all the news that's fit, that's fit to print. Do I have a motion? My mic on. Do I have a motion to approve the appointments as presented? So moved. Second. Discussion? Nick. I just have a really quick question. We were debating on what RTI stands for. Is that Regional Technical Institute? <laughs> Response to intervention. I wasn't even close. <laughs> I wasn't even close. Okay. I was like RPI. <laughs> All right. I believe we're ready to vote. Great. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Ms. Bertulia? Yes. Agenda item 10.0 is adjournment. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Discussion? Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. 
Miss Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. And Miss Bertulia? Yes. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening.